And I remember telling my coworkers at Apple just for fun, right? I was like, oh, like this cool TikTok app. Oh yeah, it's like my little children use it, right? It's a kid, it's a kid's app. This is terrible. And everybody in the comments is freaking out. What are you saying? This is the best burger and goes viral, 100,000 views. I'm like, oh my God. So I do a few other videos, start going viral. I'm like, this is it. We started accumulating millions of followers and they're all college kids and high school kids, right? So we had them all there. Welcome to the Lubo Smith Podcast. I'm your host, Lubo, the co-founder and CEO of STRV. And I'm here to talk to the industry leaders from the tech and startup space and ask them about their tips and tricks they use to operate at the top of the game. Today, I'm happy to welcome Amin Sheiko, the co-founder and CEO of Kadama, a tutoring platform where students can get help 24 seven. Amin started working on his startup when he was still at college, but once he was done with that, he snagged a job at Apple as one of the youngest engineers there. And only when the funding for the startup was on the table, he decided to move on. Since then, he has made Kadama profitable and deserved a title of Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur. So it's been quite a wild ride considering that Amin is only 25 years of age. So it was a very interesting discussion that we had. And I think we should just dive in right now. I was very excited when you accepted the invitation to the podcast and I was like, oh man, I want to, you know, find out about all that has happened as part of your journey, like, uh, you know, working at Apple, building your own startup uh, while, uh, you know, being at college and working at Apple, uh, raising money, making that startup profitable, making Forbes 30 under 30. That's just, you know, some of the achievements uh, and there is uh, many other ones. And I was like, okay, how do we break this down? How do we learn from that? Uh, what you have managed to accomplish in such a short uh, period of time? Yeah, there's a lot. And, and again, thank you for having me. It's an honor. I love your podcast, but it's a wild journey. And it flew back like this. I don't even remember what's happening. Um, because of how fast we go, things change. Suddenly you're at a high, at a low, you have to overcome a challenge, but you learn so much and it's incredibly fun. Well, we'll definitely dive into that, but I know that uh, as uh, part of your TED talk, uh, you talked about uh, making the biggest mistake <laughs> by working hard. Yeah. So I wanted to maybe start with that and uh, find out what's, what's behind it. Why do you think working hard is the biggest mistake? To give some context, right, this was back in 2018, 2019. We were, this is fresh, our, our new company, Kadama, it's an online tutoring app. Um, we were still college students, right? We didn't know too much, and we got invited to this competition. This competition, if you make it to the top, you know, three, I think you get $10,000 for third, 20, and then $30,000 for first place. And this was the first opportunity to make funding, and we were invited, right? And what happened was we, we were, get invited and then we make it from the top 100 to the top 36 and as a first-time entrepreneur college student this was a big big deal and i was like i told my entire team listen this is the opportunity and we're not going to fumble this so we're going to work extremely hard and we're going to make sure we're going to get this right but the problem is sometimes when you're extremely hard and you're focused on one thing you lose sight of the bigger picture like the vision, what's going on around you. Um, and sometimes you're obsessing too long. Like this is like attention to detail, um, fixating on one thing is you know valuable, but you need to understand you should be well-rounded. You should step back once in a while. You should reflect. You should make sure everything is going according to plan. But we went full tunnel vision without you know building, preparing for this competition. And we realized that we missed a lot of important factors that would cause us to eventually lose um, on, on this award. And so... Um, as we were preparing for this presentation, you have to like present to judges, right? And these judges come to you, and the goal is actually to talk to as many different judges as possible to sell them your idea because there's this fake currency, um, and the people who accumulate the most of it move on to the next round, right? And for us, we didn't realize that you had to talk to as many judges and keep the conversation concise. We did like two to three conversations with a few judges, so put all of our eggs in one basket, and we missed out on the... Um, on, you know, talking to as many people as possible. And so then when it came to actually announcing the winners of the people moving forward, 
at that point, we didn't know, we didn't think we did anything wrong. We thought we secured it, we were gonna move forward, and I thought this is it. We're about to validate our idea, we're gonna get this $30,000, and we're gonna become the biggest company ever. And we sat in a huge stadium, and they start announcing the names of the companies that are moving forward, and it's an alphabetical order, right? So our companies caught them assessed within K, and so they go A, B, C, and I post everything on social media. So I had my phone, I was filming every single moment, because I was expecting them to call my name. And they go, they keep going to letter A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, J, right? The letter right before K, and they skip to M. And I remember at that very moment, my phone goes down, like slowly, and everyone just looking at me going down. And I thought like, to me, that meant the company is terrible. Like it meant that they, because we didn't move forward, we have a bad idea, we should shut it down, it was all over. And you know, as a naive entrepreneur, a lot of times the first failure, and that was the biggest failure, um, you may feel like it's the end of the day for you, right? But in reality, as an entrepreneur, you fail 50 times you know, a day and then you learn from it. But um, I realized that we were working so hard on this, small, on this very you know, core vision, when in reality, we should have taken a um, reflection, um, thought about what's going on, right? Talk to more people. And so um, this taught me to do this thing called the creativity walk, where every time I'm in a situation that's stressful or on a big goal, I step, I clear my mind, and I just try to like, um, reflect on all the different pieces, try to put everything together and see like, okay, well, am I on the same page? I'm on the right page? Or am I maybe thinking too hard about something, right? And ever since then, right, I've been using that learning. Like three months later, we got accepted into an accelerator um, and they gave us $25,000. And then, you know, a year and a half later, we raised our $2 million round. So, you know, we, I could have never thought about that in the moment. I thought it was actually over. Yeah, it worked out in the end. And <laughs> yeah. Of course, as an entrepreneur, you have to go through these obstacles. And like uh, when someone turns you down, it doesn't mean that the idea is terrible or anything like that. It just means that you need to hustle through and uh, figure figure that out. It's not that, you know, being on an entrepreneurship journey would be walking on uh, a Silk Road. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's definitely full of those challenges. But uh, yeah, I think that when you mentioned the tunnel vision, that's often when you get stuck. And uh, I, I experience the same, that like it's great to, uh, from time to time, look at like the broader picture and uh, what I say is that you need to detach a little bit from like the day-to-day to see from the bird's eye perspective, okay, okay, this is where I'm headed. Am I doing everything uh, that is pointed to that direction? And if not, then you have a chance to course correct. So yeah, 100%. I definitely uh, think that there is something on that. But uh, like, I'd like to go back a little bit and maybe find out where the seed to be an entrepreneur building products was planted. Was it like always part of your vision? Because like uh, uh, you have studied computer science, right? And uh, you have a background in tech. You went to work at Apple as one of probably one of the youngest uh, yeah. people uh, on staff. Um, so how did that uh, come along that you wanted to start your own thing? Yeah, I know it was a very interesting journey and unexpected. I had no idea I'd ever be an entrepreneur. When I was in elementary school, middle school, even high school, I, I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Um, I remember just taking random classes. The only thing back in the day I knew that I, you know, the only thing, I, the true clear goal I had was I just had to do good in school because, you know, I come from a Middle Eastern background, you know, academics and important. You're either a lawyer, you know, you're either a doctor or an engineer, right? Um, and, you know, academics is very important. And so I stay true focus, make sure I always get, you know, I had a 4.0 all the way through school, even almost graduated university with 4.0 until that one, you know, one operating system class hit. Um, <laughs> but really, really good grades. Um, but my, you know, my mom, when I, we'd have a lot of stuff, like a lot of toys, right? And she's like, I mean, like you have all these toys and you don't use it. Do you want me to throw it away? Or, you know, do you want me to like, like you want to sell it to people. So she like introduced this concept of selling all stuff that you, you don't want. And so she, for like, I think when I was like in middle school, she's like, okay, I mean, get all the toys you don't want, put them in the room right now and I'll come buy them for you and give them to your younger brother. So she would come buy my old video games and I would negotiate with my mom and something about that in the moment I didn't know, but it was like this negotiation mentality, reselling, like business mentality. She was, you know, was curating in my head. And then, um, you know, later on, a few years later, um, 
I discovered a MacBook, and I was, I was in love with a MacBook, but it was super, super expensive compared to traditional computers, but it was cool. I wanted it. I think this was also in late middle school, and I was like, well, if I can't get a MacBook, I'm going to buy you know, maybe cheaper computers and resell them with the same taxes my mom taught me until I could afford it with the profit. And when I got my first MacBook, then I started to actually turn it into like a side business. I would fix people's phones. I would basically buy them for lower and, 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 and get a markup on them. And I was doing this in middle school and high school. So that kind of taught me business. Like, wow, business is kind of cool. And me, I'm Syrian, so I'm Arab American. And, you know, for those who don't know, in Syria back in 2011, 12, 13, even till now, there was a huge refugee crisis. There was like a civil war there. And a lot of Syrians, like... I'm a first generation. This is the generation right like after me, right? So it was super close to be me. A lot of them lost their homes, right? And they're they're fleeing out to different countries and they have nothing. And in the back of my head when I was a kid, I I wanted to help, but there was nothing I could do. Um, I live here in America and you know, things like toys, right? That cost like to us we get them and you know, we don't think too much about them, but to them they would love it, right? Just yeah. food, a meal, right? And in the back of my head, I was like, damn, like, I can't really do anything. And so I started to volunteer here. And for every person I would help here in the United States, it's as if I help somebody in Syria because that's the best I can do. And so I joined a lot of nonprofits, um, helping a lot of children like, in, in shelters. And at the same time, right, I was going through school and an opportunity came in high school where I could basically take two years of college in high school. So at at the same time I would graduate high school in 2016, I would, I would have the high school diploma and the associate's degree from a community college. So I was jumping between community college and high school at the same time. And there was in the high school I went to didn't have too much diversity. And me as you know, a diverse person, I could have stood out. Everyone was like, oh, that's the one. I was like one out of three Arab people in the school. And so I always felt shy. I felt uncomfortable sharing my culture. So I was I always kept to myself, right? Um, and so I feel like that constrained me in a little bit. But when I transitioned to this community college atmosphere, while you know I was still 16, I saw so much diversity, people from all over the world, like Europe, Asia, working together, creating amazing things. And um, I joined a club and I was like, wow, like, you guys are creating so much impact and there's value in people being different, right? Like in a lot of places, in a place where everybody's the same, they may talk bad about people being differences, they may make fun of it, you may feel you know, that you don't belong there. But here I felt like I belonged. And I had this opportunity where I could create a club. So it's a club um, called Code for Care where we can build mobile applications that help nonprofits. And I was keep in mind, I had I didn't know anything about computer science back in the day. And so in order to create a club, you have to convince staff to actually sign on for you to, to basically be able to open up this club. And so I go to my computer science teacher. This is my first CS class I've ever took. And he knows I know nothing. So he's like, how on earth are you going to build anything? You barely even know how to do system to out there print hello world, right? Like, how do you expect to do that? You're probably just doing this. So it looks good on your resume. I was like, no, I'm not. Which, you know, in a way I was, but I was like, no, I wasn't. I want to be able to make an impact, right? Um, and he's like, no, no, I don't believe it. Everybody opens up a club and two months later, it shuts down once they graduate. This is going to be you. I was like, you know, what? I'll prove to you that um, I'm serious about it. So I convinced 20 people. Um, who, I'm like, listen, if we create this club, we can at least try to make an impact. In worst case, it looks good on your resume. Let's go find. So there's office hours. Teachers are they're in their office um, where they help their students. Um, and I was like, okay, we're going to go find his office hours. And we literally walked to his office. I like kicked the door open. I'm like, listen, his name is Bill Iverson. I was like, listen, you told me no, but I convinced 20 people to create this club. You have to sign it right now. And so we basically pressured him to signing it and we opened up the club. And um, we spent, you know, six months trying our best to just build apps to help nonprofits. We didn't actually accomplish too much, you know, 16, 17 year olds. But the whole point is, at that very moment, I realized that I love to be able to create something, be a leader in something in, you know, in technology, but also helps people, right? And this was in 2015, 2016, which was the year I was graduating from high school. And that same summer, I actually came up with the idea to create my company, Karma. Um, and it was the transition from high school into the university. What was the inception uh, when you got the idea for Kadama. Yeah. And like, how were you thinking? Because it, it, it took you quite a while, right, to um, play with the idea, figure out what it was. But uh, where did you source uh, the idea in the first place? Yeah, we, we've pivoted multiple ideas. Like, we've had four big pivots before our success. And by the way, for any other entrepreneur listening, um, Twitter, there's so many different companies out there, Airbnb, they do a lot of changes. And 
at the end of the day, it, there's always that one final pivot, which the world knows about, right? And that's what you get known for. And for us, that was tutoring. But in 2016, I, I ran into a friend. Um, his name is Marwan. He's like a long-term family friend. We don't talk too much, but we ran into each other that summer. And I was like, hey, like, you know, I love creating things. I'm studying computer science. You're studying business. What if we can do something together? And we just jotted down a bunch of different ideas. And one of the ideas was a platform that connects customers with providers. And it was an app that helps you with all services. So like handiwork, like handyman services, yard work, pet care, tutoring was one of them. It was like 13 services. So think of an app that does everything. And we were naive back in then. We thought that was feasible. But in reality, nowadays, there's an app in a market for each one of them, right? They're all different startups are worth, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. But that was the initial idea. And we worked on that from 2016 to like, I believe 2018 to 2019. And we realized it was you know, really hard to get traction. Um, and at that point, we get accepted this accelerator with the University of Washington Accelerator. It's very prestigious. They accept only six teams a year. They give you very successful mentors. And they basically said, you guys should narrow down, only work on maybe one, two, or three services. And we eventually narrowed it down in 2019. But in, in that time period from 2016 to 2020, there was a lot of learning. You know, building the app, building the prototype, figuring out how to get customers. But there's a lot of ups and downs because I was still a student too. And I, I went to the University of Washington Computer Science. We're like number four in the nation. We're very, very hard and like very stressful, right? So managing everything together was very intense. Well, when, when did you figure that um, it's a good idea to be starting the business and uh, going to college at the same time? Like, how did you how did you figure out that it was the right move? Because oftentimes people think about, okay, I go to college, then I get some initial experience, and maybe then I own I start my own thing. Yeah. Um, and it seems like uh, you did all of this at the same time. And what we will probably cover later on, then there is also the work at Apple that came at the very Everything. same time. Right? <laughs> yeah. To me. It- I remember very vividly, it was at like a, we were eating food, it was like a plaza, and that's where we met to have our first meeting, me and my co-founder, Marwan, and then Danny joins later as a third co-founder, but initially it was me and Marwan, and we, I, we, when we finished eating, we are like, this is a solid idea, we we're very excited, and before we headed to our car, like, you know, I was on one side of the parking lot, he was another, and before we forked off, I remember telling Marwan, listen, all of our friends say they're gonna create something, but it never goes through. It's always talk. There's no walking, right? There's no actually executing on it. But today, we're gonna promise each other that this will actually work out. And no matter how hard it is, we're gonna make it happen. And something about that moment, like it was a genuine interaction, and we both were very sincere. And at that moment, even knowing that it would be almost impossible because we were 17, he was. I think he was 16. I was. I just turned 18. Um, it felt impossible. We we like we were very adamant on making it happen, um, and we knew also that we both lacked the skills in business and computer science because I'd only taken one class. And so, to me, it was like, well, I need to learn the different topics, right? But it it, it doesn't make sense for me just to wait. I'd rather try now, even if I fail. I'm learning. Um, and when the time comes when I've learned the skills, we can pursue it at a more accelerated you know, uh, speed versus just waiting and doing nothing for two years and then starting. So the worst case to me was just learning and failing. So I was like, okay, this is a no brainer. Um, but clearly, cause I was at school, we didn't know how to code. Um, and, and my co-founder was a business person. We're like, well, how are we gonna build the first prototype? And so we thought outside the box, we're like, well, our parents don't have that much money. We don't have much money. Let's go somehow find an internship this summer and use that money from the internship to fund like a contractor to build our first version. And so I somehow found a way to get a web development engineering role, even though I don't know anything about web development. He found a way to get some sort of like accounting job. I don't know. And he also doesn't know. And I think we both saved up around (laughs) $40,000 and we put that all into his contracting firm overseas. And they started building our first prototype while we were at school. It's insane. (laughs) It's like, uh, you are selling hard to basically make it all work. And like, I, I can say, like, I have a lot of people uh, around me that, you know, say that they would like to do this, they would like to do that, but they never take the initiative yeah, to never actually it. launch it, right? Yeah. To, to start with it. And I'm like, why? Like, if, uh-huh. if, if you spend a lot of time talking about it, if you would take that, and invest that time into actually creating, 
and you would be somewhere on that journey, right? 100%. Maybe it would not be guaranteed success, but you would be on the journey. You would learn something from it. And it seems like you did not wait even a second and you went just uh, right in. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong. There's a lot of hard. Like I've faced some very, very lows, like failures that emotionally, psychologically like, took you down. Like It would take the average person down where I thought it was all over, you know, days of no sleep. And even when we were this contract, like, we, I just concluded by saying, oh, we hired a contractor and the rest is decision. But no, working with them was so hard. Like there's so many times where they come to us and say, oh, this is going to be delayed by three months. Like this was a six month project that got extended to two years. And I've never done any management before. I never knew there's a concept called product design where you design the app and then another engineering efforts where you actually build it using code and then, you know, managing the pieces. There are all different things that go to building an app. And to me, it was like, oh, no. It's all one thing. And, and, <laughs> and contractors, like it's a group. And you know, when I go and give them my expectations as an 18-year-old who does nothing, I give them these crazy standards, like expecting them to build the sun, when in reality, like, this is not even possible what you're telling us, right? Because I didn't know any better. And so they thought I was a crazy kid. Literally, we were literally kids, um, 16 and 18. Um, and we were going back and forth. And the thing is, as that was happening, I was learning. So initially, the, the interaction were very um, stressful. But as time went by, I was learning how to do management. I was also learning computer science at school. My co-founder was learning business at school. And by the time we hit 2018, so two years since we started, we kind of felt like we knew way more, right? Because we had degrees at that point. Um, but that learning was, I, like, I would go through that 100 times because... Learning in the moment versus learning in school is completely different. When, they, when you're in school and they tell you, okay, in business, you never want to do this. Or in computer science, you never want to do this. Okay, cool. But when, it doesn't really teach you a lesson as much as you being in the actual action and making that mistake. Because everybody has unique experiences. And when you mess up in real life, you learn from it. And as long as you can learn from your mistakes and make sure you don't repeat it again, Eventually, you're going to run out of mistakes to make, right? And then you'll be on the right path. And that's exactly what happened. What made you to realize that tutoring was uh, the thing to double down on when, uh, like, initially your portfolio of uh, services was really, really broad? Yeah. Initially, so in 2020 was the real, real big moment during the pandemic. But before that, it was like 2019 where we initially made the decision before the pandemic. It was like six months before the pandemic. Both me and my co-founders, we've all been tutors and we've all been users of tutoring. And to us, it was very boring. And also, most of the time, it's very expensive. So if you don't have, you know, you know, well-off family, you can't afford $60 an hour or private tutoring. And so the affordable tutoring was pretty bad quality. It was pretty boring. Nobody liked it. All right. And so we wanted to make a fun way for students to get help on their homework and build this interactive community around it so people actually would love to. To, to do that, right? And that was a big problem we were trying to solve. Yeah, like, to, to me, it feels like you really came at the very right moment with mm -hmm. the pandemic because, 100%. like, everything moved online and, like, you just doubled down on that. And, uh, yeah, you, 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 you picked up the right uh, time for the pivot. Yeah, it, listen, this is a very unique story. Like, we made it on Forbes because of this. We got news publication because of this. So 2019, we come out of this accelerator I was telling you about where, you know, we had the mentorship for six months and we pivot from all these services to only eventually tutoring, but it was in-person tutoring. And we literally start getting our first five customers. The first five customers, this is amazing. Like you, you got real paying users. And this was in early, uh, late 2019, early 2020. This was like around, right before, right, the pandemic hit. And we start this in-person business, and all of a sudden, I think it was in March of 2020 um, or something like that, everything shuts down. Schools are now online. They're all virtual. Everything in person, over. And we just started this business. We were super excited about it. We had traction and shuts down. So now we're like, okay, well, like, is it over? Like, what are we going to do now? And we, we hadn't thought about this virtual because back then, virtual, there was a stigma behind it. More people, like, it was in person. That's how you do everything, right? And then even... Everything, jobs, works, everything adapted. People started to learn, oh, virtual is actually efficient and there's a lot of benefits to it, right? And we were in that same process. And I started to realize what really inspired me to go online was like, well, I saw all these students struggling in school. Um, and at the same time, I was working at Apple and they just sent me back home because you couldn't work in place. And I had a lot of free time. 
And I was like, oh, well, like, what are these kids doing with their free time? They're all on TikTok and they're all on Instagram. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, videos are going viral. Somebody eating food, somebody dancing. It's going viral. Like, this is like literally the Wild West. Everybody was becoming famous on it. And I was like, oh my God, like, is there something I can do here? And I remember telling my coworkers at Apple just for fun, right? I was like, oh, like this cool TikTok app. And everybody was making fun of it. So an app for kids dancing, even my mentor that was telling me, oh, like, have you guys heard of TikTok? They're like, oh yeah. I was like, my little children use it, right? It's a, kid, it's a kid's app. People our age don't use it. And I was like, something didn't sit about that, right? Like I couldn't just accept this app where people are getting millions of views, just, just throw it behind, right? And I was like, okay, well, instead of me creating a channel for my company so I don't embarrass my, you know, my team, I'll go do it on my own name. So I go make my own channel, zero followers. And I was like, okay, well, what can I do that will be interesting? And I go film my friend eating an In-N-Out burger. So In-N-Out is a very popular burger here, but it's controversial because some people think it's really good and some people don't like it. And people say there's other burgers better than it. And there's this whole war. It's like a meme, right? And I- We can have a separate discussion about the burgers too. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole discussion <laughs> on that. But I tell my friend to review it and he takes a bite, very, very um, suspenseful. He goes in like this. He's like, looks at the camera and he takes a bite. For 30 seconds, he doesn't say anything. And he's like- this is terrible. And everybody in the comments is freaking out. What are you saying? This is the best burger. And goes viral, 100,000 views. I'm like, oh my God. So I do a few other videos, start going viral. I'm like, this is it. Like, I don't care what anybody's saying. I'm gonna build something for my, for my company. And you know, tutoring, education, it's boring. Let's be honest, right? It's either their parents or the schools forcing kids to use them. Nobody, no kid is going and you know, getting tutoring by their own will, right? The average kid isn't, right? And even the tutoring companies, their branding is pretty boring. It's just like a parent standing by a kid. Nobody interacted with them, right? And I was like, all the kids are here. What if there's a way I can build a fun educational brand that kids will love? And so I thought about it. I was like, okay, well, instead of tutoring, what's the bigger picture where tutoring is education? Within education, there's life hacks. I'm sure like teenagers would, would want to know tricks about their iPhone, right? So I show them like, or oh, here's a quick way for you to see deleted messages or even Snapchat as a popular app. Here's a way to find out if, you know, your, your friend is hiding things from you. You can do this, 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 and here's, a, right? This these tricks, right? Even life hacks, like here's how you can save money shopping on Target. And these are all educational at the end of the day. And we started posting these on our, um, on our TikTok channel and video after video, we're getting a million views, 10 million views. Like one of our most viral videos probably has like 80 million views. And we started accumulating millions of followers and they're all college kids and high school kids, right? So we had them all there following us, engaging with us. And I remember I, I tell this to one of the mentors and they still don't understand TikTok. They're like, okay, so what? You have followers, what does this mean? There's no download, there's no users on your app. What does this mean? I was like, just wait for it, right? And now it was time for us to prove everybody wrong. We had the user base, we built a relationship with them, and now they trust us. So now it's about time to introduce to them our app. And at the same time, we were transitioning our app to be online. So we were adding all the virtual features like chat, video call, everything that you can do to interact online. And at the same time that finished, we go and create an advertisement for it, but we don't do a boring advertisement. We were like, okay, we wanna make sure we have the best clickbait so everybody's excited to see our video. So we got an onion, um, like in literally an onion, for, we go to the grocery shop, get an onion. We go to Chick-fil-A, we grab their sauce, cause, and we pour the Chick-fil-A sauce on the onion and we take a huge bite and you can hear the crunch, right? And right after it segues to our app and it says, this app will help you get an A on your homework, download it right now. And it popped off 4 million views and I think like 30,000 downloads put us like number five on the app store charts. That week, investors start emailing us, yo, what, what are you guys doing? I've never seen you before. So we started getting all these calls from investors trying to schedule meetings with us. And at that point, we knew we cracked the code to social media and education and video after video, right? We, like, we grew to like millions of downloads and users um, and started growing massively. And like within three months, we were, I think we were the first education brand to hit a million followers. And right now we're the second ever most followed education besides Duolingo. And Duolingo is a billion dollar company. They have so much money into that. And we're just a, three people who have literally $20,000 in the bank doing this for free, converting people and so forth. And yeah. Onion and Chick-fil-A sauce. That's, that's, that's why, what that's makes why it we're viral. Here. That's why we're here today. <laughs> no, that, that, that's amazing. <laughs> like, where do you find the creativity for that, as you mentioned, with the in and out burger and like doing these kind of things. It seems like you have the taste and the team around you has the taste 
to produce these like catchy videos that really drive attention. And I have to say that there is a tremendous amount of skill that is needed in terms of taking the following that you create mm -hmm. into making a conversion to go and download your app. Because I have seen massive accounts that you know people have where they struggled big time to mm -hmm. actually drive it to a meaningful conversion, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, uh, buying a product, subscribing in, to a service, or downloading an app. So it seems like you really cracked the code of uh, you know, producing viral content as well as figuring out what's the right channel, how to, how to basically drive the conversion as well. Very, very hard game to play, but first of all, like. I have a really solid founding team. My brother, Danny Shaco, um, he and I are very creative together on the marketing side. Like me and my brother, before even caught him, like he, he did a lot, but we would do fun videos on the side on my own channel. Like we had a lot of different series, like a missing girl series, a very drama. Like people were very engaged trying to figure out how are we gonna recover the missing girl, right? It was like a CIA type of style. I think 100 million views on that series other type of series like that. And then my co-founder, Marwan, me and him are very compatible on the business side, right? So business side, right? So I have the, me and him on business side and me and my brother, Danny, um, on the marketing product side, right? So together, we have marketing, product, and business, right? And to us, the first problem was like, okay, well, first, how do we get awareness? And that was with discovering the niche, the education, fun stuff, life hacks, like here's how you can take notes more efficiently. Or during Zoom classes, everybody was doing Zoom classes. We did fun stuff sometimes. Well, here's an extension you can do to move your cursor so your screen doesn't turn off and you can go back to sleep while your lecture is going on, right? <laughs> Just funny, funny stuff like that. Um, so we did that. And then when it came to actually promoting our product, we we're like, okay, well, at the end of the day, let's be honest. Every, not every, but most student is going to be struggling in school at a certain time. We you know, finals week, midterms week, exam weeks, right? So if this is the time period where they're struggling, if we can find a video that can actually attract their attention and we show them the business value, which is you literally get an A because a tutor for very, very low affordable rates, we're one of the most affordable platforms, will help you out, then how could we ever go wrong? And so, you know, The Onion is an example. We did so many things like hanging out upside down, like just so many crazy things, but we had the, you know, the hook that we know kids of the demographic we had would like. And keep in mind, my so at that point, like, oh, this was in 2020, so I was I was 21. My co my second co-founder Marwan was like around like 19. My and my younger brother, he was like 17. Like we were the age of our demographic. We knew how they think. And so the way we designed the app, it we didn't we removed all the boring part, no showing them how to sign up, literally scanning the photo. Sending it to the tutor, they give you a tutorial on how to get the answer. That simple, two seconds with a clickbait, they, it was a formula for success. And that literally would translate to downloads. And we started getting so many downloads from all different groups. And our challenge wasn't really how to get the downloads. It was, we're getting all sorts of downloads, but how do you actually monetize them? Because if you get a, milit a middle school kid to download the app, it's very hard for them to pay. We eventually realized college and, and late high school is the sweet spot. So our big challenge was like, okay, well, when we're getting too much downloads, let's try getting less downloads, but let's try to get the users who will actually end up paying. And there was a whole journey. Like we, so this was 2020. From 2020 until mid 2022, we were optimizing the experience, product market fit, like doing crazy things for us to actually figure out how to build an app where people convert well to pay. And actually, it's a there's high retention. Both the tutors are making a lot of money where they feel comfortable spending more and more time and the consumers are coming back because they're getting a lot of help. Like some of our tours make, have, at this point probably have made like $400,000. Like first year, some of crossed a hundred thousand dollars, right? Like these are six figure jobs that you would get working at Silicon Valley, right? And um, we knew because we created such amazing opportunity for you know tutors to make money, they're gonna be passionate about their job. They can put the right care into taking care of the students. And everybody on our app, by the way, it's the same age. Our tutors are between 18 to 22. And our students are between, let's say, 16 to 22. So it felt like you're talking to somebody who's your friend. And that was part of the psychology game we played. We knew it's very embarrassing and awkward to go to your teacher who's maybe 50 years old, 60 years old, and ask your, 
it asks them for a question because it feels awkward, right? But when it's somebody's your age, you talk about the same things. You talk about football, you talk about soccer, you play the same video games, right? And you can resonate with each other because you know, you know, you, you like the same things. And that was a very good compatibility, which was one of many reasons that made our app really successful. Well, you talk a lot about uh, life hacks and producing educational content. Is there one life hack that stands out all of of all of them uh, throughout your life that you would say, okay, if I should name one life ha- life hack, this is what it will be. So there's many. Um, there's a lot that I personally like. But I'm gonna talk about the one that the world likes. About. This life hack was so good. News. The news started writing about it. Like, what does the world need to know? What's the number <laughs> one life hack that uh, everyone should be leveraging? That's the question. <laughs> oh, this is a very hard question. Right, now. I just say this right now. It depends, but. Um, Damn, well, there's too many life hacks for me to tell you, but... Uh, What's the, the one that picked up the media attraction? The one that picked up the, the media question was a Zara one. So Zara is a, a, a place where you can go shopping for clothes, men and women, but women really love this place. And what I discovered was on the pants, there's shapes on the back. You know the back where like it puts you like the, the size, the waist size and the length size? There's shapes, a triangle and a circle and a, sw- a square. And nobody knew this, but it turns out that a circle indicates that, for example, this could be too loose or a rectangle a bit tight and a square perfect to size. I, I may have missed up the order, but the point is nobody knew this. And now, for example, if you like to wear things that are a little bit tight, you go for the shape that represents a little bit tight. If you like a little bit loose, you go for that shape. And when I posted that, I think it got 80, no, across all the social media, over 100 million views in just two weeks. And the news literally started were going crazy about it. And um, people were freaking out. They were trying it. People were going to start. People were replying to the video, showing it and making sure it works. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was amazing. And, um, uh, yeah, so that one that shocked me. And, and I just happened to discover because I was at, I was at the store. I was like, I think I was with my family. And I, was, I pull up like a pan. I was like, Wait, why is there a triangle here? Um, and then that's how I realized it. Uh, did you ever get uh, some feedback from Zara uh, <laughs> why they kept it such a secret? Because it seems like it's not uh, publicized that much and no one uh, really knows. No, that's, that's, why, not... that's why people probably went crazy. I don't know why it's not publicized, but like the, the reporters, like Fox, um, Fox reached out, um, you know, Daily Mail, Mirror, they all reached out and they all, <laughs> for me for a statement. And they all contacted Zara for a statement. And there's other, like, I've done one about Costco. Costco's like a, like a wholesale. You go shopping for food and grocery and stuff like that. And I did a trick there where basically the numbers all have a different meaning. So if it ends with 99, it means there's nothing on sale. If it ends with like a, for a seven or a four or a three or a five, for example, it means it's like marked down. And if it's an asterisk on the top right, it means it will never come back. So this is the last time to buy it. And when I did this, literally Fox business came, like, please let me write about this. How do you discover this? And I was like, oh, I didn't know people cared this much about it. Um, and so but like everybody, the whole world can, not just our users, right? And so well, um, at the same time, like, you know, this, we were doing this for my brand, Kadama, but like I started building my own personal social media channels because like people want to learn about this. Why not leverage it, right? And so um, it's crazy because like, We just added value by education, and as a direct result, people were downloading our app for tutoring, people were gaining, and like everybody was benefiting. So it's like a win-win for everybody, and I think that's what builds a good company. Or um, when you add value, right, people are going to want to use you, and that's really why we became super successful because everything was built for the customer, right? Even our brand, there was nothing. You couldn't go wrong with it, right? They either engage with us on social media or they go and use our products. Do you feel like it has something to do with uh, you trying to look under the hood, trying to question things and trying to look at like, is that a triangle, circle, a square, whatever that is, or why Why are these uh, weird numbers there? Like, uh, where where do you think this is all coming from that you have this level of curiosity to really go deep and, and find out about uh, those little secrets? Yeah, no, me, my co-founder Marwan and Danny, like we... We just, we think different. We don't want to be like, we like we always like learning. And part of learning is discovering and being open to new ideas. And all these hacks that we teach people, we learn them super fast. We pick them up. And then, so we just teach them to the world. And um, to us at the end of the day, like obviously like we benefit from it, but like just seeing the people's reaction, how much value adds to people's lives, it motivates us. Like, well, if so many people are learning from it, why not I go spend 10 minutes making this video and share it to the world, right? And, you know, when you've done this so many times, it kind of comes to you like just randomly I'll see something, right? I'll be like, oh, we can make this into a life hack, right? 
Like, literally, I was having a conversation with a friend. Something came up, and I was like, oh, wait, hold up. What if we tell the world about this? Because this is actually pretty useful, right? We're, I think we were at Disneyland. We discovered, like, a trick you could do there. Like, it turns out, like, for example, there's lanes, right? So in Disneyland, whenever you go on a ride, um, most of the time they split right and left. And that's just for the sake of reducing inflow. So you can go right, left. They lead you to the same place. But psychologically, humans... Uh, most people are either right, like, you know, you're either left-handed or right-handed, but a lot of people are right-handed. So naturally, when you split off, people tend to go towards right because the bar is there, they're leaning forward. And so on average, if you go on the left lane, you'll get there faster to the front because there's less people. And we tried it out. I was on one lane, my, my, I was my brother, he went on the lane, and he beat me to it, right? And so you just think of them on the spot when you've done too many. That That's amazing, and it's very insightful to always, like, look at the... Uh the things like w what's behind it right yeah. so being being very very curious um the other interesting topic that i would definitely like to cover because i think that we have you know talked about the journey but uh, skipped one uh one very important part and that's the work for apple right yeah. that happened you know no like one uh, could not even imagine that you know while doing all of that uh, uh studying in the college Uh, building your own startup, being part of an accelerator and uh, scaling it up. You also managed to get uh, a full-time job at Apple as one of the youngest people there, yeah. probably. Yeah, yeah, I know. Something about my life is it's the multiple of two. I So high school, two years in high school, freshman and sophomore year, and then I get the opportunity to do the community college while in high school. So then I did that two years. And then the university, I studied the University of Washington Computer Science, Finished that in two years. And then Apple, two years, startup. It took us two years to become profitable, which a lot of people, like, that's, like, one of, like, besides being profitable, being sold or acquired, like, those are the top three things as an entrepreneur you want, right? Um, and so Apple was just, a ha that was between 2018 to 2020. So that was in between me graduating university, computer science, and the day I left Apple was the day we secured our $2 million fundraising because our investor was, like, Oh, well, we're gonna invest in you. Well, just leave your job, and here's a two million dollar check. And so, we bo be both me, and my co-founder. He was working at Getty's Images. I was at Apple. We put our two weeks notice, and we left. But in the meantime, Apple was an amazing journey. First of all, I told myself if I was ever gonna work at a company, Apple is my number one. I love their product. I love their vision. Um, and I've been a fan since day one. Like all my products are Apple, right? Um, and when I went in, I went in as a software engineer. As you said, I was one of the youngest. I was younger than all the interns. Interns come in, they're like, interns are like, I was like, I just turned 20, one of the youngest, the youngest from my team. Um, and I came in with this mentality to learn and everybody was like shocked because like, I guess I naturally look a bit older because I have a beard. So people like think I'm 26 or something. I'm like, oh no, no, I just turned 20. I'm like, what? What are you doing here? Um, I came in as a software engineer. How? Uh, well, I studied computer science and what's funny with Apple is at the career fair, so keep in mind, I was working on my startup and I'm the type of guy, well, Just because I'm working on my startup, it doesn't mean I'm not going to look at the other options. I always look at my options, and then I debate which one is better at the moment. So in my mind, was I'm going to get a job while I'm burning, building my company, and when I raise funding, then I'll leave full-time. And so the first time I actually applied to Apple, I, I got an interview, and I failed it. Um, but what happened was they liked my energies um, and like how I you know, react to things, so they put my name in the system. And I think six months later, it was, so this was in the fall of... I would say fall of 2019, and then, um, oh, sorry, so there was uh, this was fall of 2017, and then in, in spring of 2018, I get a random email from Apple saying, oh, we've heard a lot of great things about you. We would love to invite you down to Cupertino so you can meet the team. They like, I skipped all the initial interviews. I don't know why. So the first interview, I, I interviewed like six people there, and, I, and it was just all in-person stuff, like giving me problems, and I, I guess I did really well. And then I they sent me back home, and I get a call, one final call was like the director. He's like, You know, you did a really, really good job. Would love to give you an offer right now. Like, it's I know it's last second because usually internships start in the summer, and this was literally happening in the summer. You want to fly down? You're going to get the job. I was like, yes, let's do it. So we negotiated. Um, I, we agreed on an offer. I went there, and I started off as a software engineer. But for me, um, I was an entrepreneur. So, you know, being a software engineer doesn't really one to one overlap with the skills and the stuff you like to do as an entrepreneur. Because as an entrepreneur, you like to do a lot of different things: marketing, operations, and even engineering, but as an engineer, all you're doing is coding. And I like coding, but that wasn't what I'm, what fulfills me. And so my manager was like, oh, wow, like you're coding, but you're solving things fast. You're contributing to design. You're helping a lot of people. Um, and like an opportunity came where I could work on a small project. 
um, for fun. And my my, uh, my basically manager nominated me. He was like, okay, well, I'm going to choose this person from my team to contribute to the small project. And when I did this small project, and I can talk about it right now because it was released, um, it, it, would, it was such a good project. My manager was like, you need to present this to the director. My, the director was like, wow, this is so amazing. Present this to the VP. And by the way, these people are the ones who present in, in the Apple events. Like anytime you see the events, those are the guys talking. Like the VP, his name is Ron. Like, um, and uh, he was like, wow, this is so good. Present this to Craig, who's the CTO. This guy's right under Tim Cook, the CEO. Oh, yeah. oh, so I yeah. went all the way to the very top and I pitched to them this, it's, as, you know, an iMessage is the threads feature and you can reply back to people um, and you can mention people in the app. Me and two, two, or like, yeah, two other people, we built the first prototype. We pitched it to them and they liked it so much, it rolls out in the, the iOS in the, in the next year. Um, and, and when that happened internally at Apple, they're like, okay, this guy's an entrepreneur. And so they invited me to other secret projects where I'd be working on my core team, but I'd be contributing to these other secret special projects that haven't been released, right? Um, and then I pivoted to working on things. So I initially came in as an engineer on the location team. I contribute to iMessage, and then I actually end up working on the Apple Research app, which is a health app where doctors actually connect the patient's smart Apple watches, their phones. You know, they have sensors like it monitors your heart rate, your gyroscope to this app, and it does studies on the patient. So it can, you know, if, if they're trying to figure out what, what kind of conditions does this patient have, this helps them. And I literally, me and, if, and the team I was on, we built the first prototype for this. Internally, we used it to test out the app. And then because the product was good, right, they use that as a basis to go build the actual functioning one for production. And so I did a lot of those kind of things. And then, so I was learning a lot. It was really, really fun. Obviously, you know, Apple pays really well. I met a lot of amazing people and now 2020 hits along and this is the story I already shared, but the pandemic, they send everybody home. And in my spare time, I discovered TikTok and the opportunity for education. And that's like, you know, six months after our first viral video, investors are pouring in and one person comes in and says like, I've been to Y Combinator. I've seen all that. Uh, his name is Grishin. Uh, it's uh, Grishin Robotics is the firm. Dimitri Grishin is the lead investor. He's the founder of MailRU. It's the biggest Russian. Uh, it's like the equivalent of the internet for Russia worth five, $5 billion, I think. Literally, um, he, was, he, he leads this and he's like, I've been looking for an education app that does gamification, that makes learning fun. I couldn't find anything, but you guys are the ones. And they offer us a term sheet. Um, everything was well. We sign it. We leave Apple. And then, yeah, we start our on full time, first time in my life, first time um, leading a startup. It seems like you really had a blast at Apple. But in the end, the decision to leave was uh, not really that difficult one. Yeah, it, to be honest, it was such like, I don't know what else I could have had better at Apple. Like I, but... At that moment, it would, the stars were all aligned, right? Like the pandemic, education was suffering. Education was a hot thing. We're education, social media. And we literally cracked social media and education, right? So it was a no-brainer. And even internally, my team at Apple was very supportive. Like my manager, um, Jeff, he was like, listen, like we, this opportunity, for sure do it, right? Worst case, you can just come back to Apple later on, right? Right, we'll always be here. You did a really good job. You can come back anytime, right? And so... I had a very good relationship with everybody and I was like, yeah, this is a no-brainer. And and keep in mind, right, once you raise funding, you're allowed to take a salary, right? So even though I'm leaving, okay, Apple's a very lucrative job, right? I did take a salary cut, but the point is like, I can provide for myself, right? Take care of my family, stuff like that. So there was nothing, there was there was no red flag. It was yeah. like a no-brainer. No downside. Yeah, no downside. I like that. Then you mentioned that like in your um, kind of career and, and life, everything comes with it, with those like two year increments it's been like that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the other uh, two year increment that I would like to talk about is uh, basically um, taking the company from raising funds to being profitable which is roughly another two, two years. years yeah <laughs> and uh, I know that it has not been easy but you have deployed some very smart tactics and thinking Behind that, to actually get to profitability, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit because when you shared that story with me uh, earlier when we chatted, it really resonated that like you know there is multiple different ways how you can get to being profitable, and it's yeah. not just you know increasing the number of users or no. like. Uh, uh, stuff like that, but there's a lot of different ways. And I think that you have already 
proven to me hugely that your level of creativity is uh, uh, definitely, you know, on an extremely high level. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Th this is a very, one of, it's a very fun story to tell now because people can learn a lot from it. But in the moment, honestly, I, this is competing for the worst moment of my life at this point. But um, so to give you guys some context, right? We raised money in like just out of 2022 into 2021 and almost, you know, like er, mid 2022, almost, you know, a year and a half, something like that. Um, 2021 to 2022, like you got the market, everything, economies up. people are predicting a recession. Um, people are starting like personally and also even in the investment world. We live in this VC where they're, you know, where VCs basically invest in companies like nobody, everybody stopped investing. Not a single company was in, getting checks. Very, very rare. So it was almost impossible to raise money. And in the startup world, how it usually happens is you'll raise money, you'll plan out how long the money will last you because you need to pay for things like expenses, you pay for things like, you know, building the product. And for us, it was like around a year and a half, two years, right? So it was timed. Mid-2022, we'd go on another fundraising, we'd go raise our Series A round, and all of our numbers were looking good to go raise a, a, a good Series A round. But it doesn't matter how good you were doing at that point, everybody stopped investing. And um, this was around, it was like spring of 2022, and um, we were like, we were like in a position where we we're growing really fast, but it was about time to raise money. And my co-founder comes to me and says, I mean, like, we really need to start thinking about fundraising. We have around four or five months of um, cash left in the bank, and we need to get something fast. Otherwise, we're going to be in a bad situation. And so, you know, before we even realized how hard it was, we start talking to investors. We literally like 20 meetings with different investors. We're talking to everybody, and very quickly we realized this is, this is not the same world we were in just a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, they were giving the highest valuations, and now they're doing nothing. It was literally the opposite, right? And um, we were spending so much time doing it, and like, like there's like two, three months left, and my co-founder is like, listen, like, it's been two months, not a single person is like caving in. Like, we're in a very, very bad situation. By August, if we don't figure this out, we're gonna be zero. This company, with these, like literally millions of people who are using us, the millions of social media, people like who are, so many people depend on us, literally making income off our apps. So many students depend on us for the help. We're going to zero because we can't operate. We're burning more money every month than we're actually, you know, you know, saving. Um, and I was like, okay, we need to think of something else. First thing we're gonna do, do me an analysis right now. I tell Marwan, he's very good at now. This is his thing: operations, efficiency, figure out every part of the business that's not giving us a good return on investment. So anything related to promotional spend, cut it off. Any of our gamification, anything that's not giving us a return where we're spending money, not getting anything, remove it. So the so remove that first part of the onion. We cut down a little bit of the expense, but things were going in the time was running down. This was July now. August, next month, we're about to hit zero. And I was like, listen, none of this is gonna work out. We're a marketplace right now, for, for those who are listening. It's like Uber, right? We're, the, the students pay um, the tutor, um, and we just take a percentage. At that point, we took a 15% cut from every transaction. That wasn't enough. I was like, Marwan, like, I know people don't wanna hear this, but if we go from 15 to like 30 or something, this is gonna make us not only profitable, but like profitable where we can sustain and grow even faster. But we can't just do this to our tutors. Like, it's like they're just gonna freak out. They're gonna lose money for no reason. That could cause costs to go up for customers. This is a very risky thing to do. People, companies like Spotify, all they take years to increase, you know, the like the cost of something because it could really affect the unit economics. But I was like, we have no time, we have to take a chance. But what I'm gonna do instead of blindly doing it is I'm gonna personally call up 200 of our tutors. I literally send Zoom invites to our top 200 tutors. I'm like, listen. I'm the CEO, I'd love to talk to you for 15 minutes. And I explained to them, I'm like, listen, we are considering, I never told them about the crisis, by the way, because they, they're just a tutor. They wouldn't, it's, it's not their responsibility to know what's happening as a startup. I just told them, listen, we wanna increase our fees, but if we do that, in return, we're gonna build you these 10 features that are gonna make your business so much more efficient, and you're gonna actually end up making more money with the fee increase than if we kept it the same. And if you don't believe it, we literally did forecasts off their actual numbers. Like a tutor who was making like $60,000 in a few months, we did forecasts off ex all their weaknesses. Like we were like, okay, well, you spend a lot of time wasting trying to find two students who are gonna pay you good money. So we're gonna build an algorithm that's gonna predict for you how likely a student is gonna pay, and that way you can go there instead of you talking to every single tutor. And a bunch of features, right? Um, improving our algorithm that would make you make more money. And we sold them. I sold around like 180 out of the 200 people. And they're like, okay, switch me up. And I started switching them up one by one. 
And as I was switching them up one by one, um, their fees going from 15 to 30%, we were analyzing what the market effect would be on this. If they prices increased, will it affect the consumers? Are the consumers paying more money? Because for us, we're an affordable tutoring app and we have to make sure it remains affordable. And we noticed that it continued to be affordable. It's, it's a market, but at the end of the day, there's always the people charging low and high. So it was always a middle ground. And when I realized this, I was like, let's roll this out to everybody. And, and it, was, it was doing really well. There was no harm in our business. And all of a sudden, we went from being negative on the PL statement so that, uh, to being positive. And I thought a little bit more about it. I was like, well, hold up. We were super creative with how we did this. How about we discover um, the most optimal time to, to cause an increase? Instead of making everybody start off at 30%, why don't we do this down the line? Because any person who uses a new service, you need to fall in love with it. And with a job, the one of the biggest thing is making money, right? So if tutors make money, that's a good sign. But early on when you're new, you're new, you don't know how, you, don't, you can't make that much money when you're brand new because you're still learning. And so it was too sensitive to, for us to increase the price when you're brand new. So we did an analysis and we realized on average, when a tutor hits 10 jobs, they're never leaving our app because they've made enough money and they've learned the system where it becomes so lucrative, they would never leave, right? Because there's not, on average, we also pay the highest once you have 10 jobs, more than almost any other tutoring app. And so people would leave and when they hit them, they would stay almost forever with us, right? And I was like, okay, that's genius. If 90% of our tutors have more than 10 jobs, we're gonna take the hit on that 10, 10%. And at the 10 mark, that's when we ask you, would you like to go from 15% to 30%? And once we discovered this, we solved the problem where we would turn off a lot of tutors early on. We solved the problem of, you know, of revenue because now we're actually becoming profitable. And at the same time, we made the experience better rolling out all these new features with the profit and the students still had the same cost. And this all happened from the start of August to end of August. And we've literally just been going up since then. Like when you become profitable as a company, it's a whole different game. You are not stressed that night. Everything is operating smoothly. At that point, it's literally putting fuel to the fire because it's already running, right? And but to get to that point, like I'm telling you, like all nighters, like three days, like it was very, very unhealthy, like three days of no sleep. Because imagine there's a countdown in seven days, the company's gonna go to zero, right? And like if you don't try to save it right now, it's over. Like this is like a child to us, right? It's like when I when I heard the news, I was like one and a half months left before it was all gonna be over, and we still didn't have enough traction, right? I thought it was over, we're gonna lose the company, right? So I, I thought it was all over, it was the worst part. I didn't speak to anybody for those three months. I was just like in my own world thinking it's all gonna end. There's so many lessons learned from just this, just figuring out that, you know, it's not about bringing more students or more tutors, but like being extremely creative mm -hmm. about how you set up your pricing and how do you actually process a big change uh, of going from 15 to 30 percent, right? And you jumping in and scheduling a Zoom call with yeah. uh, 200 of your tutors, I can totally imagine how exhaustive that will be. Yeah. But um, it's like yeah. four days, every 15, 30 minutes, new call, new call, new call, new call. And like it was, I read my voice, I lost my voice and everything. Um, at the end of the day, I have though, no doubt. Yeah, no, but we made sure at the end of the day to make sure that we're not compromising the experience. The tutors had a better experience after the students, likewise, and the app became much more better. I think that forced us to understand the product better, learn our customers, learn all our weaknesses, end and out, in and out. That's brilliant. It's like and also like figuring out that like you only offer the upgrade uh, past you know ten uh, ten sessions. I'm very proud of that like, one. That was actually like. That was the most proudest moment ever. Like that's like a very like, not a lot of people can like realize like, oh, at 10, that's when you do it, right? Because most people are like, most pro services, you get the basic or pro, but you have to do it up front. You know, when you go down the app from the app store, it's up front, right? You get a two day trial and that's it. But the way we built it was off the data. Um, that's what the data told us and we chased the data. Well, you have, uh, you know, uh, achieved a lot already. Uh, these are big accomplishments that we have talked about. What do you think is uh, awaiting you next? Where would you like to take it? Yeah, I know there's a lot of opportunities. Obviously, continue to make sure that Cotton is continuing to growing um, in, a, in a good story for that, continue to benefit people. But even personally, like um, really mastered social media, like huge following on my personal. Um, I'm very like, I'm very creative. I like to build new things. 
Um, so definitely where we're next, something that continues to help people. Um, I see myself like just always building things that make an impact, right? Um, using technology, social media, and really consumers, right? I love seeing the, res the like somebody's face when you provide them something that they've been looking for that makes an impact on their life, right? And that's what I told myself in 28, no, 2016 in high school, senior year of high school. I was like, I want to be a leader of a company that builds products, right, that helps the world. And that's exactly what, I'm, what I've been doing and what I always want to continue doing, right? And, you know, pretty young, right, just turned 25, um, and a lot of opportunities. And I love meeting new people, um, just learning from the different people. Like, just, I've been just talking to people from fashion and health, right, everybody. Just, like, meeting new people, brainstorming ideas, learning, helping people out any way as I can. Maybe even down the line, um, you know, investing in small ideas that I like helping other entrepreneurs because like I'm Arab American um, there's not a lot of Arab American um, entrepreneurs um, especially because you know th there's not a lot of times people want to look up to somebody right and especially here right the, a lot of young people like me have been re reach out on Instagram and say wow like you've inspired me to open up my company we've had like three four kids in our community create their starts because of me because both me and all three of us we're all Syrian Arab American Muslims right who, who are living here uh, making an impact, right? And so maybe even creating a fund where we go to those underrepresented groups and saying, hey, like, we like the idea. You're smart. We'd love to put um, help you guys out, right? Um, but just continuing to help other people building stuff that's cool and being creative. Is there one idea that is uh, kind of uh, surfacing itself that uh, you might consider? There's a few ideas I'm bouncing between right now, just, you know, kind of to build for fun. You, just, you get a lot of spare time here and there. And for me, instead of watching TV or, you know, playing video games, I just like to create. That's my way of, like, relaxing. Um, there's a few. I haven't thought of one, but when, when I do figure out, it'll be on my social media. Everybody will find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely uh, keep engaged on that. And uh, it was a wonderful discussion diving into, you know, the entire history of uh, what you have uh, accomplished in uh, only 25 years. That's uh, very impressive. And I think that uh, uh, it will be amazing if uh, we can uh, at some point have you on the podcast again and learn about the updates. But uh, yeah, it was a pleasure chatting with you and thank you so much for popping in. 100% it was a pleasure and thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope that means that you really enjoyed it. And if you did, please follow, subscribe or review us. And it will be tremendously appreciated by our side. There are a bunch of other episodes that you can check out as well. And I'll be looking forward to catch you next time.